Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Good. I, I'm glad to see all you guys. Let's all stand. We'll start off with a, a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Father, we want to praise you. In the midst of wherever we are, we want to praise you, Father. We just want to take a minute to lift your name up before we start asking you for stuff. Lord, we glorify you on high. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for Jesus Christ. That he lived a human life so that we can relate with our God. And Father, we lean on Jesus this morning. We lean on the Christ, Father, above anything that can be spinning around in our mind and in our hearts and in our lives, any circumstances, any thought, any emotional entrenchment that we've been getting into. We've been beating ourselves up or we've been beating someone else up in our life, Father. We want you to peer into that aspect. And Father, we just want to serve you. Show us how. In Jesus' name, amen.
Be thou our vision, Father. Let's go around and greet each other this morning, everybody. to the worst of us.
may be seated. I came up here and I muted. That means you guys were hearing everything I was saying. That, no, okay, good. That happened to me one time, and, and uh, I, I went out after, after I was done preaching, and I, and I went out, and, and somebody from the congregation came out, and they wanted to counsel with me, and they started spilling their guts, and all, it was all about their marriage falling apart and everything, and I was, I was talking to them, and, and suddenly my wife bursts out from the sanctuary and says, your mic is still on. <laughs> And that person's eyes just got really big, and I was like, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I want to I start out this morning. We're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter 12, so if you want to open up your, your Bibles uh, there, as you're turning to Matthew chapter 12, I want to clear something up. Um, last week, I, I, my wife and I weren't here. We had a, we had a weekend away, and, and uh, Pastor Albert got up and told a story about him riding a motorcycle because he was afraid that I was going to tell a different story and embellish it and make it. But I, I want to let you know, there was no embellishment needed. That was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. But just to set the record straight, I, I, was, re I was informed this week that somebody was there and caught it on video. So I wanted to show you the video of, of act what actually happened. And this, we, we can't, Pastor Albert can't dispute what's caught on video. So let's, let's take a look at that. See, we have video of it. I don't, I, don't, I don't remember the black guy being there, but hey, I can't argue with what's caught on video, uh, but I kid you not. <laughs> so no embellishment needed. You guys can tell him that I did not embellish on that story at all, right? <laughs> no, uh, no we're, we're talking about questions that Jesus asks. We're going to be in Matthew uh, chapter 12 this morning. I, I want us to look at three very short little, they're little stories, but basically they're, they're little encounters where Jesus is, encount is encountering, uh, you can call it opposition, you can call it, um, like, you know, just argument. You know, the Pharisees are, are, are challenging him on a few, on a few things. And he uses, he uses questions to draw them to a point of truth. Do you, do you like doing that? I love doing that with my kids. Have you ever done that with your kids? Have you ever, have you ever gone to them and said, you know, son, is there something you'd like to share with your dad? And they have no idea what you know, right? Especially when they're younger, they have no idea how does he know. You know, like the, I love I love the little three year old who's got chocolate all over his face, and there's there's melted chocolate all over from the cookie jar all the way to the couch. And you go and you ask him, son, did you get into the cookies? And they're like, no, I swear, right? They <laughs> they have no idea how you know. As the, as they get a little older, you have to get a little bit more creative with your. Uh, with your, uh, your, your spy techniques and that sort of thing. Uh, my, my daughter is 18. My son is 16. Um, or actually, uh, yeah, uh, they're, they're about to be, they're, well, they're about to be 17 and 19. I was just trying to remember if that had happened yet, and it hasn't yet. But uh, they're, they're getting older, and there's still some things that we know that they have no idea how we know, and we are not going to tell them. <laughs> we are not going to share with them how we know. But we ask questions, right? We ask questions to make them think about things. I like asking questions that, that bring people to the, the same conclusion just in their own mind. Because you see, when they can't answer the question except for the logical truth that they come to in their own mind, that's so much better than me just telling them the truth, right? Because they can discount all the things that I say, they'd be like, well, that's just your opinion. But if you start asking some good questions and getting them to that point, you know, where they're like, oh, yeah, he's right. And then they usually have to backpedal or they're just like, oh, I don't want to talk about this anymore. Right. OK, so he's he asks some questions. So I want to look at I want to look at three little little stories where Jesus asked very good questions. Let's start in um, Matthew chapter 12. Let's look at verses one through seven. 
and I hate getting older. Oh no, they're all fogged up. <laughs> all right, let's try this. You would think after two eye surgeries this year, I could read without needing these, but there we go. All right, would you stand with me, with me as we read God's word together? Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse one. At about that time, Jesus was walking through some grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they began breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. But some Pharisees saw them do it and protested. Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. Jesus said to them, Have you, haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. And haven't you read in the, in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? I tell you, there is, there is one here who is even greater than the temple. But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of this scripture. And then he quotes, uh, he quotes uh, Hosea here. He says, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer this morning? Dear Lord, as we're, stand, as we're here this morning and we're standing in your house, uh, Lord, as we're standing in honor of this scripture, Lord, help us to remember why we stand in honor, why we, we learn from it. Lord, this, this question that you ask these people, haven't you read the scriptures? Haven't you, haven't you seen the, the value that is, that is in there? Haven't you learned from its lessons? Lord, that's our prayer here this morning, that we could learn from the lessons that we find in, in these stories, in these, um, in these interactions that we see you have. And we thank you so much for your presence here this morning. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. So here we have some Pharisees that are, that are confronting Jesus about his disciples, okay? The, so it's the Sabbath day. Um, they're walking through a field. They're a little hungry, and so they're just breaking off the heads of some of the, of some of the, the stalks of wheat, and they're, they're, they're snacking on them, right? Now, you have to be a little bit petty, don't you? <laughs> For the, aren't the Pharisees a little bit petty? Wouldn't you consider that a little bit petty to call that harvesting? I mean, does that sound like harvesting to someone? That would be like someone going out into the garden and being like, oh, oh, look, there's a cherry tomato and popping it in their mouth. Oh, you just, you just harvested my garden. It's like, okay, come on, right? So they're being, they're, obviously they're being a little bit petty, but they're trying to catch Jesus in, in some kind of, trouble. They're trying to catch him in doing something wrong, right? And so they're, they're looking for every little thing, every little thing. And, and, and they see them do this. And so they, they confront him and they say, this, oh, look, they're breaking the law. And what does Jesus do? Jesus's response to them is he said, haven't you read the scriptures? Haven't you read in the scriptures? And then he gives an example of how David also broke the law when he went into the temple, when him and his men were hungry, they went into the temple and they ate the food that was supposed to be only for the temple, uh, only for the, the priests that lived there. He says, and don't you know that in the scriptures that the, the priests that are, that, are, that are offering the sacrifices and doing the things that they have to do on the Sabbath, don't you, don't you see that they're working? Guys, I want you to know that Pastor Albert and myself and, and Brandon and probably even Andy, we consider a Sunday a work day, Right? You know, I've had people say, well, pastors, you know, you, you have it easy. You guys only work one day a week. <laughs> right, yeah, that's exactly how it works. I download my sermons from the internet and uh, uh, just let everybody else fend for themselves during the week. And <laughs> yeah, those, these are some of the rumors that I've had, right? But, but we consider Sunday a work day. Why? Because we show up, I show up at seven o'clock in the morning. I don't go home until after one o'clock in the afternoon. I get to get up here and do this three times, which is so easy and not draining at all. <laughs> and then I go home and I pass out in my recliner because you just let you go into what, what I call a, a Sunday uh, sermon coma, <laughs> right? Anytime I've had somebody from the congregation, they, they're like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give it a try. My son on Youth Led Sunday, he got up and preached three times. His, his sermon got shorter each time, right? It was like 17 minutes in the first service. It was 15 minutes, and it was only like 11 and a half minutes by the third service. And he was wasted the rest of the day, right? He went home and slept for hours. He's like, I can't believe how hard that was, right? So Sunday, for, for the, the, the guys in the temple, for the priests, Sunday is a work day. And yet they're okay with that. You see, what they were doing is they were, they were trying to bind him by the letter of the law while ignoring the spirit of the law. You know what I'm talking about? 
binding them by the letter of the law so they could get him in trouble, but ignoring the spirit of the law. What is the spirit of the law? The spirit of the law of the Sabbath is, listen, God made us, God created the earth in six days and then he rested on the seventh. If God, he set the example for us, right? He wants us to take a rest day. That's what the Sabbath was supposed to be. A day where you committed a day to the Lord and you spent it as a rest day. Right? And so what they, they had done, they, they had taken the spirit of the law and they had turned it into the letter of the law so that they could nitpick over every little thing. Have you ever had, had that happen in life? <laughs> Me and uh, Justin and Brandon and I were working together one day and we decided to go to Wendy's for lunch. And so we were in my truck <clears throat> and uh, there was the three of us there and, and we, went in, we went through the drive-thru because this, uh, this was before they had lifted the COVID restrictions and everything. You couldn't go in. You, had, you could only do drive-thru. And so we were in the drive-thru and, I, and we got up to the thing and I said, okay, well, I've, I've got three separate orders for you because each one of us was going to buy our own lunch. And she said, she said oh, I'm sorry, sir, we can't, we can't do three orders in one car. And I said, well, I'm just going to give them to you one at a time. Just hit the subtotal. You know what I mean? I was like, just... I don't understand why. And she goes, she goes, well, we can only do two. And I said, well, we've got three people in the, in the truck here. She said, well, well, you'll have to combine two of them. And I, I said, well, we have, we have restrictions on, on how many orders we can take per car because it slows the drive-through line down. And, I, and, I, and in my mind, I'm thinking, if you just would have taken my orders instead of all this argument, we'd be done already, right? <laughs> it just would have been that simple. But she was, she was holding to the spirit of the law or the, the letter of the law and, and, and disregarding the spirit of the law. And I said, well, I said, one of us doesn't want to pay for the other guy's lunch. I said, can't you just take three? Can't you just pretend like two of us are in one truck and the third one's in his own truck? We'll pause for a minute. I'll rev the engine. It'll sound okay on your recording, right? <laughs> I'm just like, can, please, can you just break this stupid rule just for one little? I ended up buying Brandon's lunch because she she couldn't do it she couldn't figure out how to do it guys there's so many times where we ignore the spirit of the law because and we get so caught up in the letter of the law and and then we start to judge other people for that guys you know what that's called that's called legalism and it drives people away from the church not into the church Right? So, he, so Jesus is confronting them. He says, haven't you read the scriptures? And it's not just that he says, haven't you read the scriptures? He's giving them examples of when those laws were broken for very good reason. Right? He, said, he said, David, this person, that you, this king that you hold in high regard, he broke the law because it was pragmatic, because it, was, it made sense at the time. He understood that, yes, the temple was holy and that sort of thing on a regular basis, but in that moment, they were doing the Lord's work and they needed the Lord to provide, and God did, even though it broke a law. So Jesus is saying, listen, isn't it important that you, that you have some compassion here? See, really, these are questions of compassion. He said, the scriptures are there for a reason. It's not just a list of laws. These stories are included to show the comparison and practicality that, 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 those, that compassion and practicality can sometimes be above the law, right? We have, we have rules in church. We have unwritten rules in church, don't we? What do we tell our kids when they go running through the sanctuary? Don't run in church. We don't run in church. Did you guys know that every week we stack up all these chairs, we stack them up in the corner, and kids run in church? <laughs> Abby's like, the youth are in here, man, and they play raucous games. Did you know on Monday nights they set up a big curtain and they set up targets, and this is an archery range in the house of God? <gasps> right? Guys, is there anything sacred about these walls? It's just a building. The church is us. And, and us using the building to better the kingdom, to expand the kingdom, that's the spirit of the law. Should we honor God's house? Yes, we should. But not to the point where we're, we're so afraid of, of using it, so afraid that it might get damaged in some way, so afraid that, you know, I, I've had people that say, oh, you can't bring any drinks in, you can't bring, guys, we have banquets in here, look at the carpet, been there, done that, right? You won't be the first, you won't be the last, let's use it, amen? Let's use it for God's glory, right? Let's not get caught up in the spirit of the law, let's have some compassion, and, or let's not get caught up in the letter of the law, let's have some, some compassion and move forward. Verse 7, he quotes Hosea 6.6. 6. He says, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. 
That's him, say, that's him saying, reminding them that, listen, your, your rituals and your religious stuff is less important than the mercy that you show the most important creation that God has, which is what? Mankind. He said, I don't need your religion. I, need your, I, want, I want more relationship. I don't need your rituals. I, I don't need your sacrifices. I would much rather you show mercy. I would much rather you show compassion. I would much rather you bring people into my house than your rituals. We see, we see another, another story. It's right, it's right there in the next verses. So let's continue reading in Matthew chapter 12, verse 9. Then Jesus went over to their synagogue where he noticed a man with a deformed hand. The Pharisees asked Jesus, does the law permit a person to work by healing on the Sabbath? They were, tra they were trying to trap him here. It says they were hoping he would say yes so they could bring charges against him. And he answered, if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Don't you love it when people answer question with a question? <laughs> he's, like, I, he's like, I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to, you're trying to trap me in some kind of thing here. So I'm just going to ask you a question, and you're the one that's going to look like the fool here. So he asked him, he says, if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. And how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out, held out his hand and it was restored just like the other one. They were saying, they were trying to trap him. They say, they say, is it lawful for you to do work on the Sabbath, for you to heal on the Sabbath? Can you, can you see how twisted they had become in their logic, that they thought the idea of miraculously healing someone was considered work. <laughs> Can you see how far gone these legalistic Pharisees had, be, had gotten? I mean, so, so much so that it would be like, oh, you can't, you can't do that. Oh, oh, did you hear about Bob? He got miraculously healed. Did it happen on Sunday? Yeah. Oh, darn. Then no, I can't celebrate it. Can you imagine that? That's how far they've gone, right? I mean, instead of, instead of the miracle of God, instead of being like, oh my gosh, this guy's hand was deformed and he, they were like, they were like, no, 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 you can't do it on the Sabbath, right? Do you think they had any compassion for the man at all? <laughs> Sorry, dude, about your hand. Sorry, you've been living that, with that your whole life and he can fix it, but you're gonna have to make an appointment for Monday morning. See how ludicrous that sounds? And so what does Jesus respond with? He says, he says, if you had a sheep that fell in the well, wouldn't you work to get it out? So you see, sometimes the, the simplest, <clears throat> excuse me, the simplest answer is, is, is in there. You know, he asked that question to ask them about something simple. Let's take all this legalism and all this religiosity out of it. Let me ask you a simple question. If you had a sheep that was stuck in a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you do something about it or would you just let that sheep die? And he, said, he knows, because he knows what their answer is going to be. Their sheep is, that's their livelihood. That's their, you know, that's, that's what they live off of, right? The produce of their livestock and that sort of thing. He knows what their answer is going to be. And he's saying, isn't a sheep much more valuable? Or isn't a human much more valuable than a sheep? I'm going to get all of my phrases and stuff flipped around today. I don't know what, what that is, but just, if it doesn't make sense, try it in reverse. That's probably what I meant. How about that? I'll just let you guys filter it for it, right? But we, we have this, guys, I wanted, to, I wanted to give you a visual kind of a demonstration of what, of what Jesus is talking about here. Watch, watch, this, watch this video real quick. There's no sound to this one. Here we've got a sheep that's gotten stuck in this big ditch. Here's like Jesus is saying, wouldn't you just pull, pull him back out? And then here's what most of us do with our lives. <laughs> right? <laughs> Isn't that exactly what we do? God, God does all this work. God, God helps us out of the mess that we've created. God, God drags us out of our own heartache and, and, all, and, and sin and pain. And what do we do? We're like, yay, thank you. And then we dive right back into it, all right? But, it, but this is what Jesus was saying. He said, wouldn't you, go and, wouldn't you go and save the sheep? Yes, I would. He said, then why wouldn't you show compassion on your fellow brother? Isn't a human more valuable, much more, I believe he says much more valuable than a sheep? In God's eyes, isn't that true? It is, isn't it? In God's eyes, aren't we much more valuable? Who, what is the only creation that God created that was created in God's image? Mankind. 
You see, he created all the plants and all the animals and, and all the, the stars and, the, and the, 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 the moon and all the celestial bodies, all of creation. And he said it was all good, right? It was all good. And then he said, now let us spend a little bit extra time. Everything else he created with the sound of his voice. When it, when it came to creating man, he said, let us create man in our image. And it says that he lovingly formed him out of the dust of the earth. There's a little more compassion. There's a little more love poured into his greatest creation, which was mankind. Did Jesus come to save the animals? Did he die on the cross to save all the animals? Do you think God's heart was broken when, when, the, the, when the flood came and, and only two of each animal? You know, guys, I, I hate to say this. I had somebody ask me one time, you know, don't all dogs go to heaven? And I, you know, they were asking me a serious question, and I honestly said, I said, the Bible does not teach us that anything has a soul other than, other than mankind, that we are the only things that are eternal. Now, it does teach us that in the millennial kingdom and in things in the future, that there will be animals, the lion shall lay down with the lamb, that we live in peace the way God created it and intended it so that we will still have enjoyment of our animals, but I, I personally don't believe that little Fido is going to be waiting for you in heaven. I don't find that in the scripture. It's a nice sentiment, but if I don't find it here, I'll just leave it up to maybe God will surprise us with that one, right? Okay? I don't mean to offend anyone. Notice I'm, I'm tiptoeing around this one because I know there's somebody out there going, oh. <laughs> I know exactly what you're feeling. Uh, my, uh, uh, I had to put Briscoe down uh, last week. Um, he's 12 years old, my German shepherd. He's been my shadow for 12 years. So trust me, I know what you're feeling but I also know what the Bible says, and we are different. We're special, okay? So he says, he says, um, he says, we're so much more valuable than the sheep. He says, so why wouldn't you show compassion? Why wouldn't you want to, to do something good? He said, it is lawful to do for a person to do good on the Sabbath, even on your day of rest. Let's look at one more, let's look at one more little story. One more story in Matthew chapter 18. This is a couple chapters over. Um, skip over to Matthew chapter 18 for me. Um, you'll, you'll see it up on the screen if you, don't, um, if you don't have your Bibles with you this morning. I want to start in verse 10. Verse 10, it says, Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. He says, If, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than over the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly, Father, my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. He asks the question, he says, wouldn't you, would you not search? If you had 100 sheep and one of them strayed and one of them wandered away, wouldn't you go search for that one? Isn't that one still worth the effort? You know, I, I don't know how many times I've had to tell people, I've had to convince people because people buy into Satan's lie that says that they're not worth anything. They says that they're broken, that the, because of the things that they've done in their life, they've somehow discredited or disqualified themselves from God's love. I remember I was talking to a teenager one time because they were talking about all the mistakes they had made and they, and they, had, they had gotten involved in, in drugs. They'd even gotten involved in, in like, you know, backyard prostitution where they had sold their body to get money for drugs. And, and they were saying, you don't, you don't understand all the things that I've done. God doesn't want me anymore. And I, and I pulled out a $20 bill out of my wallet. And I said, how much is this worth? She said, that's 20 bucks. I said, what if I told you I found it in a dumpster in a back alley somewhere? That it had been used to pay for drugs. It had been, it had been used for criminal activity. How much is it worth now? She said, it's still worth $20. I said, what if I told you that this was used to pay for sex outside of marriage, to, 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 to pay for the most immoral things you can think of? What if I told you this, this $20 bill had done incredibly horrible things, had made those things possible? How much is it worth now? She said, it's still worth 20 bucks. And I waited for a second. <laughs> and it took longer than a second. And then she began to tear up. I said, you do not define your value. What your choices in life doesn't change your value. The only thing that defines your value is your creator. And he says, you are worth dying for. Do we understand that? 
You understand that his love is so great for us that he would leave the 99. You would think it'd be a numbers game. You think he'd be like, okay, 1% loss, I can handle that, right? I've got 100 sheep, only one of them went away. I've still got the 99, I'm doing good, right? What, what would be an acceptable loss rate? Oh, if 20 of them, I still got 80, right? But no, we are so valuable. She, God has so much compassion for each one of us. What does it say he would do? It says he would leave the 99 and he would go and search for the one that had strayed. Guys, I, I'm a, I, I used to be a bit of a gamer. Um, I used to play online games and that sort of thing. And my gaming name was always Strayed. It was S-T-R-A-Y-D-E. I switched the E and the D. And somebody asked me one time, I said, what, why is your name Strayed? And I told him, I said, because I believe I was the one that left. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up with a Christian mother and father, and they did a, they did a pretty good job of parenting. They weren't perfect. Uh, you know, I'll tell you some of those stories later. But I, <laughs> and there, there was a point in my life where I rebelled against my parents and everything they stood for. And I went out, even knowing the truth, I went out and lived my life as far from the truth as I possibly could out of anger and spite. And guys, I'm a stubborn guy. When I do something out of spite, I do it good. I was as far from God as I could possibly be, and he never gave up on me. He constantly searched for me. He left the 99, and he went after the one that had strayed. And I am so grateful and thankful for that, that I, I chose to make that my, my gamer tag so that I would constantly be reminded of how much my God loves me. Guys, he loves you just as much. What does it say here? It says that he threw, he, 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 when he finds the one that was lost, he throws a party, right? He says, he says, and if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than the 99 that, that didn't wander away. You may, you may think, well, wait a minute. Does that mean I need to go and stray so God will be happy for me again? No, that's not what that means. That means that he understands that the 99, they, they, there was safety in the numbers. There was safety where they already were. And he's kind of like Rockefeller. Did you guys ever hear that quote from Rockefeller? Somebody asked him one time, they said, they said how much money is enough? How rich can you, how much do you have to be before you'll, before you'll be satisfied? And you do you, anybody ever heard that quote? Do you, you remember what his answer was? He said, one dollar more. One dollar more. Does that mean that whatever he had, he was only one dollar from his goal? No, that meant he would never be satisfied because he was always going to search after that one more dollar. Guys, Jesus is never satisfied. He never says, okay, finally, whoo, we got James saved. We're good. We're going to stop now. Oh, man, Karen finally came into the kingdom. That's what we were really waiting for. Okay, everybody, everybody slow your roll. It's okay, right? You guys, I, I believe back in the 90s, I believe the salesman for the, the cranberry industry was killing it. You know what I'm talking about? Cranberry was getting into everything. I mean, they had cran juice. They had, you know, you had, you had craisins came out. I mean, cranberries were showing up everywhere. And it was like, dude, cranberry salesman, here's your trophy. Take a, take a vacation, right? You're <laughs> chill out, right? But he was like, no, we got to get cranberry into everything, right? Uh, hey, a cherry limeade with, with cranberry added at Sonic. That's, oh, primo, right? Anyway, do you think that Jesus is ever going to be satisfied? You think he's ever going to say, okay, that's enough. We, my house is full. I don't need any more. Guys, I'll tell you what. The day that Jesus no longer cares about the lost is the day that the lost no longer have a chance, and it's called the judgment of the earth. That's the day that he's done searching. That's the day that he's done. Guys, he's always going to search for that one that has strayed. He says, listen, would you not search? Would you not have compassion? He asks that question of them because he was saying, he was saying, guys, he was talking about the little ones. He was talking about the little children. He said, aren't they worth going after? Yes, they are. Guys, we underestimate how important our children are. You know how I know that? Because every church in America is understaffed in their children's ministry. Every church in America. We went to, we went to a big church in Texas one time in Lake Point, Texas, just outside of Dallas, they are a church of 18,000 people over the weekend. 
They have like three services on Sunday. They had two services Saturday night. They had just a massive building. Their auditorium could hold 6,000 people, right? We would be considered one of their small groups, right? <laughs> They're this massive church. And I had my children's director with me, and she was looking at this, this children's wing, and it had slides going down the hallway, and there was beautiful stuff everywhere, and half of a Jeep they could jump in and play and pretend like they're driving. It was just this opulent place, and, and she was just, her eyes just got all big, and I, 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 I kept reminding her, we don't have the budget for that. We know we can't do that. Right? Just <laughs> knock it off, <laughs> right? We're, we're, I know you're in Disneyland right now, but <laughs> chill out, right? But she asked, the, she asked the worker one time, she said, she said well, a church this big, 18,000 people on the weekend, you must not have any trouble finding children's workers. <laughs> and this lady kind of looked at her with this haggard look on her face, and she said, do you realize that there are nine babies born in our church every month? She said, that means that every two months we have to start a brand new bed babies class. <laughs> she, she was kind of, <laughs> she said, we are staffed at about 50% of what we need. And Bev, my children's director said, wow, we're at about 50% of what we need. Every church I've ever been to you ask the children's director, do you need any help? The one that says no is the one that's crazy, has given up, or just resigned. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? We always need help. Guys, you look in your bulletin right now. Do you see this big thing, this big thing on the, on the top right-hand corner of the last page? It says, help needed in the children's department. Our children's department is growing faster than, as fast as our church is, but it's growing faster than we can find volunteers. We need help there. And why, is it, why, do we, why do we not think that they're important? Jesus said, listen, it's about these little ones. He said, it is not the will of my father that any of these little ones shall perish. We need to start taking that a little more seriously. He said, well, listen, will you, would you not search? Would you not go out there? Do you not have the compassion for the people around you that you need in order to go out and, and find them? Guys, they're all around us. Are we going to be content with the 99? Or are we going to go out? See, because you know how Jesus searches these days? He uses his church. He uses his people. He lays someone on your heart. He, he brings someone into your path. He gives you an opportunity. You guys, did you know that there are opportunities to share the love of Jesus Christ all around you? Don't believe me? Say a prayer with me one, real quick. Everybody, everybody pray this pray with, prayer with me. I'm not going to tell you what it's going to do until you're done praying because then you wouldn't do it. Well, let's pray. Dear Lord, give me the opportunities that are around me already to share your love with the people that come into my contact. Amen. You know what Jesus is going to do? See, I, I faked them out. I, I prayed, and now they're all, they think I'm done. That's okay. I'm about, I'm almost done. You're good. Come on out. You know what you just did when you prayed that prayer? God is now going to take the opportunities that have been around you, that have been surrounding you every day of your life, and all of a sudden they're going to become blaringly obvious, and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I had no idea there were all these opportunities all the time. Now comes the hard part. Now you have to actually take those opportunities. But let me ask you the same question that Jesus asked them. Have you not read the scriptures? Would you not show compassion? Would you not search? Would you not search? Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Dear Lord, we're here this morning. We're living in a world that is broken. We're surrounded by hurting people. We're surrounded by people that need your love in their life. They need your compassion. They need your guidance. They need your strength. Lord, let us not get caught up in the legalism of, the, of the, the religiosity around us. Let us not look at people and say, oh, well, yeah, yeah they can't come to church. They, they don't behave the right way. They don't dress the right way. They don't smell the right way. They shouldn't be a part of our church. Let's not get caught up in the letter of the law, but let's look at the spirit of the law. See, the rules are there to show us what sin is so that we can see our need for a Savior. 
Lord, let us look at people with compassion in our hearts. Let us look at that, that sheep that has is, that is jumped into that well. And Lord, let us, let us do whatever we can to help pull them out, even if they go right back to it again and again and again. Are they not valuable? Lord, we know how valuable you consider them to be. Let us have that same kind of compassion and, and see them the same way. Lord, that they are valuable enough for us to leave the comfort and safety of the numbers in this place and to go out and find the one that is strayed. Lord, give us your eyes for just a moment so that we can see them the way you see them. It'll change everything in our lives. And then give us the strength to do something about that. Lord, if there's somebody here today who's who's not started that relationship with you, Lord, give them the courage to step out, to ask questions, to, to seek guidance and answers. Lord, we know that you said that when we seek you, we will find you. Lord, give them the courage to, to get the help they need to find that. In your name I pray, amen. We ask that you stand with us. We're going to sing a song of invitation. I'm going to be down front. If you need to talk to someone, pray with someone, you just have questions, you come and see me. Let's sing together.
Risen, he is alive. 
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. if you can.
Amen, amen. Praise God. All right, let's hear some announcements. You may be seated. You, you remember that verse in the Bible that says, if, the, if my children don't uh, worship and praise, surely the rocks will cry out, the stones will cry. Do you know what, you know what kind of music they would have cried out in? Rock. <laughs> well, and if they were on an incline, rock and roll. <laughs> rock and roll. That's right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, grab your bulletins if you would. There's a couple of things I want to make mention of. Um, I did mention already, you can see that children's ministry, volunteers needed. We made that big, loud, and proud because we always need uh, volunteers in our children's ministry. So if you don't know how to do that, I encourage you to either come talk to me, talk to one of our deacons, talk to one of our, uh, one of our regulars. They'll be sure, they'll know how to point you in the right direction. Or um, I would say talk to Kate, but she's usually so busy with the kids that she's hard to get a hold of. So call the office during the week. We'll get you in contact with uh, the right people um, to, so you can help with that. I do want to make mention of the Youth Parent Night. It was supposed to be this coming Thursday, but since this coming Thursday is the uh, middle school open house or back to school parent night or whatever, it conflicts and we're letting them win. We're moving our parent night uh, to the next one on September 2nd. Okay, so I wanted to make mention of that. Um, what else? We, summer's, oh, that's next Sunday. This bash, I was taking the back all about a Sunday morning. That was for you, Pastor Albert. <laughs> You know he's not here, right? Okay, uh, no. uh, that's next Sunday. So come, at, uh, we're going to start at 9 a.m. If you want to help us do some setup, you can come a little earlier than that. But 9 a.m., um, we're going to be in the, we're going to start out over here in the backyard. Um, we're going to have a worship service. We're going to, we're even going to, we're going to go over and tour. Um, we have to make sure we call it a tour. We can't really do anything other than a tour over in the other building or we get in trouble with the, uh, with the powers that be. So we're going to go tour what's going on in the new building. We're also going to pray over it. We're also going to, you know, get excited and vision and dream a little bit uh, while we're over there. But we're going to have lunch together. So make sure you come back next Sunday. Uh, don't come at 8. We won't have a service at 8 unless you want to help. We're going to start at 9, and a whole, the whole church is going to be together. Yes, Kim. Well, Mother, remind everybody to pray this week about what kind of verses or what you want to say. Because we're going to have all kinds of markers to mark up all the walls that are going to be covered in, with the drywall and stuff. So we want to... We want to put your name in there. We want to put the prayer verse, whatever is on your heart. So if you're praying this week, what, what God's telling you to, to, to say in our new building. Yeah. I was here when they poured the concrete, so I went ahead and put my handprints in. You're too late for that, but no, I'm just kidding. I didn't, didn't do that. But no, we, we are gonna we're gonna write sayings, we're gonna write uh, uh, scripture verses, we're gonna write prayers, uh, all that good stuff. Okay. Um, Membership class is coming up October 3rd, so if you would like to join the family of uh, the, the local family here at this church, you don't want to come be a part, um, you'll need to go through the membership class so you can sign up. You can register online. You go to our website, go to upcoming events. It'll have the event there. You can, uh, you can sign up that way, um, and then you'll, get, you'll be contacted by the office if you do that. I think that's it, but I do want to make mention of, of one more thing. Guys, I don't care where you land politically this is not a politically driven thing. This is a, we are part of the church of God thing. And I want to ask us to pray for the Christians that are in Afghanistan right now. Amen. I believe many of them are being killed and martyred for their faith. Um, we knew these things happen around the world and we knew they were going to get worse before they get better. We know that because we know it's foretold in here. Guys, it's only a matter of time before it spreads, but it's beginning right now, and we need to pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. Can we spend a moment just in silent, in silent prayer for that? Dear Heavenly Father, we know that you are aware of every detail. Lord, we know that you are aware of every soul that is in danger. Lord, of every soul that is being hunted down, everyone that is being killed. Lord, we know of the great faith. We've heard the stories of the great faith of those that are there that refuse to renounce your name. And Lord, they are paying for it with their lives. And Lord, while we pray for them, for their safety, if that be your will, for your mercy as you take them home, if that be your will. Lord, we also pray for ourselves. 
Lord, there are people that are dying because they won't relinquish their Bible. And I was too tired to read mine yesterday. And I ask you forgiveness. Lord, I pray that your church would come alive through this persecution. Lord, we've seen it time and time again throughout history. When your people fall under persecution, we do not crumble, we do not fall. We unite and we revive. Lord, I pray that it doesn't, it doesn't wait until we start facing the same persecution, Lord, that we would go ahead and unite and revive right here, right now. We thank you and we praise you for your sovereignty, for your compassion and your great love in all circumstances. In your holy name I pray, amen. Let's just consider that our closing prayer and you are dismissed. Thank you very much.